Okay, uh, let's move on to our, our the last of our invited speakers, uh, which is actually a, a tag team presentation for uh, for two of our, our uh, local folks working down at VGH and I'll just do I'll just do the introductions. So the uh, Dr. Mip Sekon is an intensive care physician at uh, VGH. He's currently a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Critical Care Medicine and the Department of Medicine at UBC. He did his medical school training, his internal medicine residency, and his critical care medicine subspecialty fellowship at UBC, and then went on to complete a neuro critical care fellowship at Addenbrooke Hospital in, at, uh, in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, he's also holds a PhD, which he completed in neurophysiology at UBC with uh, Philip Ainsley. Um, MIPS interests, research interests include delineating the pathophysiologic mechanisms of ischemic brain disease in humans, uh, working obviously to try to identify therapeutic agents. And then he will be joined in his presentation by, uh, by Dr. Ryan Hoyland, who has his, uh, his degrees in health and exercise sciences from UBC Okanagan. And his main research focus uh, during his graduate training was on cerebral vascular physiology, particularly in the, in the context of how the brain regulates the blood supply when there are reductions in the amount of oxygen in the blood. He's now working as a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Sekhan, and his research is investigating how to mitigate the injurious influence of reduced oxygen levels or hypoxia within the central nervous system uh, and looking at a, a host of various uh, hypotheses and, and studies that he's doing, looking at, uh, at, again, how to develop some therapeutics to treat these, these conditions. So I actually am not sure which one of you is going first, but um, whoever is driving the slides can go ahead and start. Thank you very much, Dana. I, um, I must say uh, uh, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, although now I feel uh, a bit like letting everybody down after those presentations by the students, uh, that those were absolutely incredible and in inspiring. So, uh, but really do appreciate the invite to be here. Uh, and uh, I'll keep my, my section relatively short because uh, I'm purely the, the appetizer for, for the main course, which is uh, Dr. Hoyland. Um, so our, our research uh, stems from, as uh, Dr. Devine pointed out, uh, delineating the mechanisms of ischemic brain injury, which uh, today have remained elusive, uh, and ischemic conditions of the cerebrum remain uh, major contributors to adverse clinical outcome, uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, we've yet to identify many uh, therapeutic agents uh, that uniformly uh, do um, mitigate uh, cerebral injury. Uh, this project uh, is in collaboration with uh, members of the Center of Blood Research, so it's uh, uh, hopefully uh, you'll find it interesting. Next slide. So the biology of ischemic uh, injury in the in the cerebrum really gets down to the microvascular uh, anatomy, uh, and specifically at the level of the neurovascular unit, which is the principal anatomical and functional uh, unit that maintains cellular homeostasis. And it's a complex interplay between the supravascular, uh, supravasculature, as well as the glial cells, such as astrocytes, and, and their interactions with the cell bodies of neurons uh, and subsequent, uh, subsequently their, their axons. Now, using cardiac arrest or hypoxic ischemic brain injury as a model of global injury, um, we've sought to delineate some of these mechanisms uh, and to identify uh, therapeutic strategies that can mitigate the additional hypoxic injury one gets after return of spontaneous circulation or during the reperfusion period. Now, on the on the the, the cartoon figure there, what you'll see is in the top screen the normal uh, state of health, whereby astrocytes surround a healthy um, uh, blood uh, cerebral, or cerebral blood vessel that maintains a tight blood-brain barrier. Uh, it's flush with oxygen and glucose, uh, and then after ischemia reperfusion, the blood-brain barrier becomes porous, uh, the, uh, is also associated with cerebral edema, and there, therefore um, additional brain hypoxia culminating in anaerobic metabolism and subsequently cell death. So if, if low oxygen is one of the mechanisms for additional injury after return of spontaneous circulation, then intuitively 
augmenting oxygen delivery to the cerebrum should mitigate that injury. And that one of the main interventions or clinical interventions that has been bantered about in the literature for a number of years is a role of red cell transfusion or augmenting oxygen content to optimize oxygen delivery to the brain after it's undergone an ischemic insult. Now there's a number of large trials uh, which have published subgroups, um, including study, Canadian studies like the TRIP trial, the ABLE study for age of blood in collaboration with the Canadian Blood Services, um, and, and a few other trials that are undergoing right now, uh, specifically in patients with brain injury, that have unfortunately failed to demonstrate consistent benefits of liberal transfusion strategies. And so perhaps those uh, results are in fact true, or perhaps there's missing uh, gaps in the pathophysiology of ischemic brain injury as it relates to red cell transfusion that have yet to be delineated. Next slide. What we've done at uh, Vancouver General Hospital now is uh, for a number of uh, years, uh, we've undertaken um, a prospective interventional study of invasive multimodal monitoring um, with a, a variety set of cath or a variety of catheters that we place within the parenchyma of the brain of patients uh, following cardiac arrest to one, help best resuscitate them, but two, also simultaneously characterize the cerebrovascular physiology. The first catheter that we use is something called a PBTO2 catheter, partial pressure uh, of uh, dissolved oxygen within the brain parenchyma, and it reads in millimeters of mercury the amount of oxygen that is dissolved within the parenchyma of the brain. Second catheter is an intracranial pressure catheter that reads overall intracranial pressure within the intracranial space. The third catheter is something called microdialysis, uh, and we're able to dialyze the parenchyma of the brain and uh, through the efferent limb uh, of the catheter are able to measure analytes pertaining to things like glucose, uh, glycerol, glutamate, uh, excitatory neurotransmitters, but also lactate and, and other metabolites. The fourth catheter is uh, a parenchymal blood flow catheter that reads in millimeters per 100 grams per minute parenchymal blood flow at the PO level. Um, and then finally, we combine this with a retrograde single lumen uh, intravenous catheter that is placed in the jugular vein and goes and sits at the just distal to the sigmoid sinus. So we're able to capture uh, venous blood as it exits the brain. This is coupled with an arterial line catheter. Uh, and so by uh, using this methodology, we're able to analyze biospecimens as they enter the brain and then finally exit. Next slide. All this. Um, uh, and this, all this data then subsequently goes into a software program called ICM Plus uh, that records the data at 300 hertz, so tremendous granularity of data. Um, this is what the um, on picture A. That's uh, that's a, a fake skull there, um, but there's four catheters, uh, all of which are placed through a single uh, cranial access uh, hole, uh, burr hole, uh, made at the bedside. We're able to do this within about 15-20 minutes uh, at the bedside. Uh, the patient doesn't need to go to the operating room or anything. Uh, and then, and then B, uh, figure B shows you all the different catheters that subsequently pass through the bolt and sit directly within the parenchyma. And with that said, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Hoyland. Awesome, thank you, and thank you for having us uh, here to talk today. So, with that introduction, um, I'm going to show you some data just to to define the the problem that MIP has described as we've seen it in the patients we've collected data on so far. And so what, what we want to reduce is secondary brain hypoxia. And the way we're defining that is brain tissue oxygen levels of 20 millimeters of mercury or less. And so if we look at this figure here, we have PBTO2 or brain tissue um, oxygen on the y-axis. And then we have our hypoxic ischemic brain injury patients that have had a previous cardiac arrest with brain normoxia. So brain tissue O2 above this threshold of 20, and then those with brain hypoxia or HX uh, below the cutoff of 20. And in 18 cardiac arrest patients that we've um, conducted this neural monitoring in so far, um, these eight patients, there are eight patients, pardon me, that have brain normoxia and 10 patients with brain hypoxia. And now I'm also gonna include some data on uh, 14 healthy male controls. Now these controls obviously didn't undergo the cranial access bolt procedure, but they did, for the purposes of the data I'll, I'll present, um, get instrumented with a radial artery catheter as well as a, a jugular bulb catheter. 
Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail here. And so um, here we kind of have a, a, a overview image of the majority of this experimental setup. And so we simultaneously collect jugular ball blood samples and arterial blood samples. And that allows us to calculate cerebral AV or arterial venous gradients. And why we do this is that in the setting of cardiac arrest, it's a global ischemic reperfusion injury. And so if we were to collect peripherally circulating blood samples to assess a variety of biomarkers, um, there's issues relating this specifically to the brain. And so by collecting um, arterial inflow and venous outflow samples, we're able to get a snapshot about what's happening in the brain in the cerebral vasculature um, at a given moment. And so this allows us to um, collect data for biomarkers related to astrocyte injury, exonal injury, and neuronal cell body injury, as well as um, some other markers that I'll talk about in, in a little bit. And when we look at this data, um, we see something very interesting related to these patients. And so what I have on the y-axis here is the cerebral release of glial fibrillary acidic protein, or GFAP, um, in picograms per mil. And so a higher value here indicates that the venous concentration of these samples is higher with these paired arterial venous samples. Um, and what's important to note is that this is on a logarithmic scale. So the differences that are visible here are quite large. And when we look at our controls and our hypoxic ischemic brain injury patients that have brain normoxia following resuscitation, they've got significantly lower release of this marker compared to those with persistent secondary brain hypoxia or hypoxia or uh, tissue oxygenation below 20 millimeters of mercury. When we look at markers of exonal injury, um, NFL here or neurofilament light, as well as total tau, we again see the same trend where there's no difference between controls and the patients with brain normoxia, but a large increase in release of these markers in those with brain hypoxia. And then finally, looking at cerebral release of biomarkers for neuronal cell body injury, such as neuron-specific enolase and UCHL1, we see the same trend. And so the, the conclusion from this is that the secondary brain hypoxia we're observing in these patients is associated with ongoing cerebral injury um, in the critical care setting. And so following resuscitation of these patients, um, our efforts need to be turned to reducing the neurologic injury. And a follow-up our follow-up to that and, and what is effectively the overarching goal of all of our research now is how might we improve cerebral oxygen delivery to alleviate the secondary brain hypoxia in the critical care setting. Now, if we take, take a step back and look at this from the view of what controls cerebral oxygen delivery, um, well, broadly speaking, this is controlled by arterial oxygen content and cerebral blood flow. And if we break it down a little bit more, we know that arterial oxygen content is governed by the partial pressure of arterial oxygen and arterial oxygen saturation, as well as the concentration of hemoglobin or hematocrit. And then cerebral blood flow is regulated by a multitude of factors, but two primary ones of interest are the partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide and mean arterial pressure. Now, while we're, we're investigating all of these different factors and how they might relate um, to the physiology of these patients in the critical care setting, I'm gonna focus on hemoglobin concentration for the remainder of the talk, with kind of the overarching research question of what is the role of blood transfusions in alleviating secondary brain hypoxia and post-cardiac arrest hypoxic ischemic brain injury? Now, one um, thing I want to note is that this is in the setting of uh, euvolemia with low hemoglobin concentrations and not in the setting of um, bleeding or hemorrhage. Now related to this question and, and where we're taking this work is related to what's called S-nitrosic hemoglobin. And so I wanna provide a bit of background on S-nitrosic hemoglobin signaling and how it may be relevant in the context of blood transfusion. So again, if we look at this model of arterial inflow and venous outflow with our paired radial artery and jugular bulb samples, um, we can get an index of the exchange of molecules uh, between the cerebral vasculature and the brain parenchyma. Now, of course, the red cell is carrying oxygen, um, and as uh, blood moves through the capillary network, we're getting an offloading of that oxygen um, for the tissues. But at the same time, this um, SNO or SNO hemoglobin 
which is a, a nitric oxide moiety that's bound covalently to um, a cysteine residue on the beta chain of hemoglobin. This is getting released alongside um, oxygen release um, in an oxygenation dependent manner. And what this leads to then is an increase in plasma s nitrosophiles or RSNO for short, which then migrate to the endothelium and elicit vasodilation. And this is a, a, a key um, regulator of hypoxic vasodilation. And this has been demonstrated um, across multiple mammalian species um, and, and a multitude of different preclinical models. But then what's important for the experimental paradigm that we operate under is that you can also measure um, these s nitrosethyls in the venous plasma. And so elevated levels of RSNO in the venous plasma compared to arterial um, can be inferred to indicate an increased release from red blood cells. Now, specific to its implications in, in the role of transfusion for alleviating brain hypoxia, um, some fundamental work in this area conducted by Jonathan Stamler and his group in 2007 demonstrated that the concentration of s nitrosa hemoglobin in blood that's been removed and stored is depleted quite quickly. So in as little as three hours, over 85% of the s nitrosa hemoglobin is depleted. And, and this depletion then um, is maintained over longer storage durations. And so while um, I'm certainly not an expert in, in um, other areas of blood storage, typically um, these deficiencies in stored blood are thought to take much longer. And so there seems to be a very short acting um, mechanism here that may be important in blood flow control. And just to show some representative traces by this group, they showed that um, upon transfusion of fresh blood, they can elicit a vasodilatory response in isolated vessel preparations, but in both expired blood and uh, blood on the first day following removal that's been untreated, um, this vasodilation is markedly impaired. However, what they did show is that repletion of these s nitrosethyls on hemoglobin can restore vasodilator function. And so kind of the, the three take-homes to keep in mind as we go through our data um, after this is that s nitrosa hemoglobin is depleted in stored blood within three hours, so it's very quick acting. This reduction in s nitrosa hemoglobin is related to impairments in vasodilator function of the blood, but we're able to replete s nitrosa hemoglobin and improve vasodilatory capacity, um, at least in some isolated vessel preps and some uh, in vivo preclinical models. So how might this pathway be impacted by blood transfusions in the setting of brain hypoxia in the critical care unit? Um, well, first, I'm going to take you through some preliminary work where we wanted to address this mechanism um, at the level of healthy human physiology to get a better understanding before we moved into um, the clinical arena. And so what I have here is the arterial to venous plasma nitrosethyl gradient. Um, and so uh, my apologies, it's a bit backwards from before. So on this figure and from here on out, um, a negative value is indicative of release. And so for this experiment, what we did is we took um, a group of 12 healthy young males, and we had them breathing a normoxic gas mixture, so effectively room air, and we took um, paired arterial and jugular bulb blood samples in, in them, and we analyzed them for nitric oxide species, including um, s nitrosethyls And we showed that in the setting of normoxia, there's effectively no gradient. But when we make these research volunteers hypoxemic by getting them to inhale um, a reduced concentration of oxygen that elicited an arterial oxygen saturation of around 70%, uh, a, a negative gradient arrives, which is indicative of release of these nitrosethyls. And so as I described earlier, that this would indicate uh, to me that nitrosethyls are being released from the red blood cell to affect um, vasodilation in conjunction with the, the physiology that's been described in other research models. Now, when we look at the cerebral blood flow response in these individuals, or global cerebral blood flow being GCBF on the y-axis in milliliters per minute, we can see that um, in response to hypoxia, cerebral blood flow is increased. And this, this, this has been described across multiple labs for many, many years. Um, but what's most important here is when we look at the relationship between the blood vessel, or the blood flow response, pardon me, and the gradients of these nitric oxide species, at an individual level. And so on this graph here, I have cerebral blood flow on the y-axis in milliliters per minute 
And then again, the arterial to venous um, S natural thiol gradient on the X axis. And as we move leftwards on the X axis or more negative, that means there's more release of nitric oxide. And we can see that across these subjects, there's a relationship where a greater negative release of nitric oxide uh, is related to a higher cerebral blood flow. So this provides some evidence that this is in fact um, an operating mechanism in humans and it's relevant um, within the context of the cerebral vasculature in episodes of hypoxia. Now, if we move to um, the cardiac arrest patients, I again have arterial to venous uh, plasma nitrosethyl gradient. Um, and what we see is that here I have pre-transfusion and 12 to 24 hours post-transfusion that in the pre-setting, so this is in the critical care unit still, that there's a negative arterial to venous gradient of plasma nitrosethyls. And if we compare this to our healthy human data, we can see that the magnitude of this gradient is quite similar. And so this again is in line with what we, what we um, have seen with normal hypoxic physiology. And what's also important to note is that as little as a one nanomole change in, in this molecule is important as around 10 nanomoles will elicit maximal vasodilation, um, at least in isolated vessel preps. But what we see following transfusion um, is that this gradient is effectively abolished. And I think what is really powerful here is that um, is to consider that this is in critically ill patients, which are extremely heterogeneity heterogeneous for multiple reasons. And the data is quite consistent, barring two individuals that moved in the opposite direction. And so um, the consistency of this relative to what we would normally see in other measures in the critical care unit is quite, uh, quite remarkable. Now, we've collected these data. So this is the data on the left part of me was in 14 critical care patients. But what I want to focus on is a subset of three patients that had the quadruple lumen bolt placed with each of the measures that Dr. Sakon um, described earlier. And so on the y-axis here, I have cerebral blood flow and then the, the time post-transfusion. And so we have pre one to two hours, two to four, four to six, six to 12, and then 12 to 24 hours following transfusion. And we can see that following um, blood transfusion, cerebral blood flow has gone down. Now, this isn't necessarily generally surprising as we know there's an inverse relationship between cerebral blood flow and hemoglobin concentration or hematocrit. Um, but as you'll see, the magnitude of this decrease is what's really important. Um, now, when we look at cerebral vascular resistance, so we scale this to the hydraulic pressure head or cerebral infusion pressure, we see that re resistance has increased as well. And so this indicates that there's some level of cerebral vascular vasoconstriction, which is not what we would want if we want to improve oxygenation um, in these patients. Now, when we couple the change in cerebral blood flow with the change in arterial oxygen content that we would get from increasing hemoglobin concentration, we see overall that there's a net reduction in cerebral oxygen delivery. And this is perhaps um, the most important figure of these three to focus on because really we're administering the transfusion to try to improve oxygen delivery to the brain in these patients. If we look at the resulting um, brain tissue partial pressure of oxygen, we see that in these three patients, there's no um, consistent change one way or another. Um, and then what I did want to show, because we do have some of this data in a larger cohort with the brain tissue oxygenation, because more, more patients have undergone this measure specifically, is that across nine invasively monitored patients, we again see no significant change in oxygenation following transfusion at the same time points. And then finally, um, in these three patients, if we look at some of the microdialysis data, or the lactate pyruvate ratio or LP ratios I have here, um, what we see is that there's no consistent change. Um, but what's important to note here is that an LP ratio of 25 or higher tends to be considered indicative of anaerobic metabolism. And so what we would hope is for the LP ratio to drop below 25 following a treatment. And that, that doesn't happen in any of these patients. Um, so to, to summarize and to wrap this up, if we bring this back to the schematic I, I, I put up earlier of the pathway, what we hypothesize might be happening and what we want to investigate in a bit more detail uh, moving forward is if we're transfusing blood that doesn't have um, high levels of S type or normal levels of S nitrosyl hemoglobin, does this then lead to an impairment of S nitrosyl release during cerebral circulatory transit? A reduction in the release of uh, plasma nitrosethyls, 
and then overall um, impaired vasodilatory function, reduced blood flow, and impaired oxygen delivery. And so with that, I'll, I'll end the talk um, and just leave my acknowledgement slide up here for the many people that have been instrument, instrumental to this work, as well as the funding bodies that have supported us. Thank you for inviting us to talk. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. That's a really interesting piece of work. I'm just curious, and I can't, I've probably asked you this before, but but um, I'm just curious about how old the red cells were that the patients were treated with. Do, do, you, do you know that? Yeah, great, great question. Unfortunately, we, we don't. We, we do have the um, tracking numbers that uh, Andrew Shee's looking into, um, but, but he hasn't managed to pull them yet. Although being that all these patients are at BGH, my impression is that you know, we typically have the oldest blood, uh, typically uh, provincially, so it would probably be at the bottom of the pile. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say that was, I, I think that you guys, you guys get the older blood that's come in from the smaller hospitals in the, out in the hinterlands. So uh, yeah, that, that, could, that could be a contributing factor. Um, I also have something that, you know, and this is too many years ago now, and I, I, I can't remember all the exact details, but the, the graph you show of the very rapid, um, the very rapid loss of, of SNO is that work was, I believe there's actually a compound that Dr. Reynolds had been working on and I think was trying to commercialize that actually preserved the SNO. And I, I don't know wh where that's gone, but that, uh, that might be worth looking at. I don't know what its status is, if he's still trying to commercialize it or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure. I've definitely tried to, you know, I've scoured the internet, looking into information about the patents, et cetera, that they have filed, but I haven't come up with anything specific. I do know they, they've published some research in 2018 looking at um, uh, an inhalant that you can use to increase uh, s nitrosine and hemoglobin, but um, the utility of that in um, like repleting s nitrosine and hemoglobin in banked blood, I, I'm not too sure but they have looked at it in, in other contexts where um, they've got healthy research volunteer, volunteers, part of me, to um, inhale a specific nitric oxide gas mixture that almost doubles the, the levels of s nitrosine hemoglobin. Yeah, no, I, I remember him having some kind of an additive solution that you could put in stored blood. And, and so, I mean, I'm, he responds to emails, so it would be okay. worth asking him about yeah, it. I think I think our hope is once we've kind of figured out exactly what the problem is, he will have solved it for us and then we can just use whatever, <laughs> is, whatever is there. That would be good. Okay, um, sorry, let me monopolize the questions there. Others, either questions in the chat or put your hand up. Oh, I'm unmuted. Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, hi, Mip and Ryan, that was Great. Can, I'm going to just ask, and it's, it's probably a partially or a large part unrelated, but I'm just curious, can you overshoot in terms of oxygenation of the brain and then um, risk um, uh, down the, down the um, a, a later reactive um, abnormal angiogenic response analogous to the retinopathy seen with hyperoxy, you know, hyper oxemic conditions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, without a doubt, you know, one, of, one, of the, one of the mechanisms of reperfusion injury is certainly oxygen-free radicals, uh, which uh, certainly elicit a, a mitochondrial injury at the, the level of the electron transport chain. So that, that is certainly, um, you know, definitely a, uh, a plausible mechanism. You know, what we, what we, what we think we can do in this cohort of patients is because we have simultaneous uh, brain tissue oxygen monitoring, but plus uh, microdialysis, which sort of gives us an idea of the balance between lactate and pyruvate. Um, you know, we, we think we can, um, our, our goal is to, and so far what we've done is transfuse people who are one hypoxic uh, based off of the, the PBTO2 catheter, but who are also demonstrating a concomitant anaerobic state uh, uh, with, uh, with a LP or lactate to pyruvate ratio greater than, than 25. Um, you know, typically clinically, we wouldn't, if somebody had, let's say a 
PBTO2 that was less than 20, but the lactate to pyruvate ratio was okay, uh, that's not somebody we would intervene on anyhow. Um, so, so certainly we would, we'd hope that, you know, we're, and, and the goal of this would be to provide um, uh, a physiologic description uh, of what's happening to these people following transfusion, specifically in those who are in the uh, oxygen deprived state, uh, as well as anaerobically metabolizing. So it's interesting that you're, you're aiming to monitor that and to, uh, you know, optimize the conditions. Do we do that, not we, because I'm not in the clinic, but do we do that in, say, in, in cardiac, myocardial ischemia, where we probably have a hell of a lot easier access, and yet we don't monitor that, we just, you know, we just, um, uh, you know, we just do things without monitoring the output, and yet maybe it has an impact. Um, yeah, per perhaps. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, yeah, excellent point, Ed. Uh, I'd also humbly state, um, you know, just because we're we're monitoring, perhaps doesn't mean that we're doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, uh, having the numbers there makes me feel good um, yeah, and, okay. and justifies uh, medicine-based evidence. But, but I'm not sure if if uh, that that's uh, right. Yeah. You'll know when you know. Wait, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, are there, do we have other questions? Comments? Anybody want to volunteer to get one of those things stuck in your head? <laughs> <laughs> no? I'm impressed you got volunteers. That, that I can was, offer a few volunteers. That's always been the most I've impressive had. thing to me that anyone can sign up for that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. That was uh, that was really interesting and, and uh, it's nice to, think about what other uses of blood are out there. <laughs>